so we'll start now i'll just give the introduction sure good afternoon everyone i take india welcomes all the participants for today's regional uh, distance learning seminar series today's topic is post exposure prophylaxis for hiv and the speaker is dr aman sharma Dr. Aman Sharma sir is the professor at the Clinical Immunology and Rheumatology Wing, Department of Internal Medicine, Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research, that is PGI MER Chandigarh. He is the program director with the Center of Excellence in HIV care. His areas of research are rare rheumatological diseases and HIV TB co-infection. He has around 460 scientific papers published and is an author to 60 book chapters. We welcome you sir for today's session and request you to start the session. Thank you, Madam, for this uh, very generous introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's session. Uh, the I'm going to talk to you regarding a very important uh, topic today, which all of us uh, associated with HIV care are going to be, uh, you know, it is very important for all of us to know because we are going to get so many queries regarding this post-exposure prophylaxis, it's different aspects and i think everybody has to be absolutely clear as to what needs to be done in a given situation with this uh, i'll start off with the, the topic of pep uh, and the session objectives are that, that by the end of the session the participant should be able to understand uh, the need of post exposure prophylaxis uh, enumerate the illnesses which are transmissible occupationally. Evaluate a healthcare worker who has sustained an injury and uh, prescribe the appropriate PEP as per the program. And also is able to discuss the follow-up procedure after starting the PEP. So healthcare providers are prone to accidental exposure to blood and other body fluids or tissues. Uh, there is occupational risk of uh, blood-borne pathogens like hepatitis C, hepatitis B, besides HIV. We know as far as the programmatic uh, context is concerned, we know that there has been the scale-up of HIV testing and ART services, and now the H people living with HIV are surviving longer. In fact, it's become a chronically manageable disease like diabetes and hypertension, and they are also utilizing the healthcare facilities increasingly which means that there is increased risk of accidental exposure uh, of HIV virus uh, from the PLHIVs to healthcare providers. So healthcare personnel include the emergency care provider, the lab personnel, the autopsy personnel, the hospital employees, medical and nursing students, and other healthcare professionals at different levels. So just to briefly tell you the definitions which are going to be used during this presentation, a uh, healthcare personnel is any person, whether paid or unpaid. This is very important for us to understand. Either at paid or unpaid, working in the healthcare setting, who are potentially exposed to infectious material. And what are those infectious materials like blood, tissue and specific body fluids and medical supplies, equipment or environmental surfaces contaminated with these substances. And what is an exposure? Exposure is that may take place, that may, a healthcare, that may place a healthcare personnel at risk of blood-borne infections. And the risk of HIV, I mean, you know, the most common injuries are hollow bore needle injuries. And we have to tell that the risk is just 0.2 to 0.5%. And uh, there is a difference between occupational exposure and non-occupational exposure. Occupational exposure, as the name ex suggests, is exposure to potential blood-borne infections that occur during the performing the duties at the workplace for healthcare professionals. And non-occupational exposure is which occurs outside the workplace setting, which just like unprotected sex and also in the context of sexual assault. Needle stick injury, this is a broad term. This includes the injuries caused by needles, but also by other sharp objects, which can be blood, vial, glass vials, surgical blades, forceps that accidentally can puncture the skin. The, the whenever the exposure is concerned, one will one person will be the exposed person who is at risk of acquiring the infection due to the exposure of either blood or potentially infectious body fluids. And the other is source person from source means the source of infection, the person either identified 
or unidentified when we say the source is unknown, the possible source of contamination through blood or potentially, infec potentially infectious body fluids. So who is at risk? Practically all the people who work at healthcare facilities like nursing staff and students, emergency care providers, labor and delivery room personnel. These are just a broad outline, surgeons and OT staff, lab technicians, physicians, interns, medical students, dentists, health facility, cleaning staff, mortuary staff, clinical waste handlers. So all these are at risk of occupational exposure. So just to give you a case scenario and I'll dwell deep into it as we go along, who is at a higher risk amongst these two? The first uh, scenario is healthcare worker during disposal of shafts from the obscene gynae cater has a prick, a prick on his finger after a positive patient's delivery. So it's a prick on the finger with a sharp, but this after the procedure has been done. The other scenario is an internist who has had a splash of pleural fluid on the face from HIV positive individual. So keep these scenarios in mind and I will tell you what is the context uh, during subsequent day, during my presentation. So who is at risk of infection? Or rather, I, we should say who is at higher risk of infection that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. What are the different types of body fluids? Uh, you know, not all body fluids are considered as at risk because of the viral concentration in those fluids. It is It stands to reason that blood obviously is the highest. Uh, the highest risk is from blood and also from semen, vaginal secretion, CSF. These are all closed body fluids, synovial joint fluid, pleural fluid, peritoneal cavity, pericardial fluid and amniotic fluid. Other body fluids which are contaminated visibly with blood. And these are those ones which listed here, which if not contaminated with blood are not infectious, like tears, sweat, urine and feces, saliva, sputum, vomitus. Unless these have blood, these are generally considered not at risk for transmitting the infection. There are various, uh, the risk rates are higher dependent upon the exposure route. And as you can understand, more than 98% with, with infective blood transfusion, 20 to 40% with, with the perinatal, um, uh, in, uh, in, inter, without, if there is no intervention in the perinatal period is 20 to 40%. Sexual intercourse is 0.1 to 10% depending upon the type of sexual intercourse, like the vaginal intercourse, the receptive area is higher, uh, uh, larger. So the risk is higher, 0.5 to 1%, anal 0.005 to 5%, oral is again listed here. Injecting drug use, 0.6%, in needle stick injuries, 0.3%, and uh, mucous membrane splash to eye or oronasal is 0.09%. So comparative uh, risk after needle stick injury, when we compare with HIV with hepatitis B and C is 90 to 30%. This depends on whether it, the virus hepatitis B viral infection is in the replicative phase or the non-replicative phase of Hep B. So Hep B, the transmission rate is much higher as compared to HIV after needle stick injury. And hepatitis C, the risk is lower to one to almost 2%. So risk depends upon the type of body fluid and the route of contact or exposure. So another scenario, which you should keep in mind, a medical officer presents to the emergency care for evaluation of a needle stick injury, which had happened two days ago, uh, while uh, inserting an IV line uh, uh, to the HIV positive patient. So would you start PEP or not? And keep this two days window in mind and we'll, we'll discuss as we go along and you should be clear whether PEP is required or not required if, you know, I will answer this question later on. So things that you need to know before starting the PEP is that what is the risk of contract, contact, contracting HIV? Are the, there are factors that might affect this risk? How effective is post-exposure prophylaxis? Also an important question. If the patient comes, say it was two days, if the patient comes after five, if the person comes after five days or seven days, is it too late to start the PEP? What are the drawbacks of starting PEP? Which regime should be considered and what follow up has to be, should be arranged while starting PEP. So what is the risk of contracting HIV? Uh, it basically depends again, the average risk of uh, acquiring HIV following different types of occupational exposure uh, is low as compared to the Hep B or Hep C infection. I've already, already alluded to it, but just to drive home the point again, 
the risk of hiv is 0.3% risk of hep, hep b especially replicated or non replicated phase is 9 to 30% and hcv is 1 to 1.8% and mucosal membrane exposure the risk with H, of hiv is 0.09% so and the risk of zero conversion again these are uh, these are the odds ratio if there is a deep injury the risk the odds ratio is 15 visible bloody device 6.2 device in the artery or vein if there is a by chance if there is a uh, direct injury to the to the vessels obviously the risk would be higher uh, if the if there if this is an old data from 1997 study terminally ill, Ill source 5.6 because the viral load would be higher if especially if it will increase if their patient uh, the source patient is already on therapy i'll touch up on those later on and if the azttpp has been given the odds ratio you can see it much reduced so does the post exposure prophylaxis does make a difference the other likely risk factors are what is the viral load whether the glove has been used or not so it has been shown that use of gloves decreases the volume of blood transmitted by as much as 50% and the other thing is whether the injury is from a hollow bore needle or a solid bore needle large diameter needles weakly associated with increased risk obviously hollow bore needle large volume needle would have a blood within it and if it is large and hollow the risk would be higher drying conditions there is a tenfold drop in infectivity every 9 hours hiv is a very labile virus and uh, you know this is something which we need to to consider so once we've reached a stage where we have to uh, you know we have a person who has been ex exposed and we we have to see how do we really manage so what are the various steps the first step is the the most important step is the first aid we should not forget that first aid should be provided immediately then is the establishing the eligibility of post exposure prophylaxis subsequently if it is required then we have to counsel for pep then we have to assess need and prescribing post exposure prophylaxis lab evaluation and follow up of an exposed person so how do we provide the first aid it depends upon where the exposure is if it is a exposure to the skin immediately wash the wound and the surrounding skin with if there is an intact skin you should wash but i think then the risk obviously on the intact skin is not there but if there is a wound over the skin then we have to wash the uh, you know wound and the surrounding skin with water and soap and rinse do not scrub do not use antiseptics or skin washes this is very important for you to know do not use bleach chlorine alcohol or betadine if there is a splash of blood or body fluids wash the area immediately again do not use antiseptics these are known to increase the transmission if there is unbroken skin then wash the area immediately and do not use antiseptics if it is in the eye irrigate the exposed eye immediately with water or normal saline sit on a chair tilt the head back and ask a colleague to gently pour water or normal saline over the eye if the contact lenses are being worn they will act as a barrier so don't remove the lenses rather while they are there irrigate the uh, uh, clean the eye and then once the eye is clean then remove the contact lenses do not use soap and disinfectant on the eye and in the mouth spit the fluid immediately rinse mouth thoroughly using water or saline and spit again repeat this process several times do not use soap or disinfectant in the mouth and uh, the the designated physician at the uh, facility who has been designated for the pep should be contacted immediately that service is available 24/7 at our institute and i am sure that that is available that is made available at all the healthcare facilities where um, where healthcare workers are working so how do we the most important thing is as a reflex if there injury one has a reflex of putting the 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 finger into the mouth this must strongly be discouraged and once you've done that we have to see, establish the eligibility for post exposure prophylaxis now coming on to this answer so it should be initiated as soon as possible where required and preferably within 72 hours i'll explain to you why 72 hours one has to assess the severity of exposure and the risk of transmission one has to assess the hiv status of the source of exposure and also one has to assess the exposed individual also so there are three categories of exposure one is mild exposure 
mild exposure is exposure to the mucous membrane or non intact skin with a small volume contact with the eyes or mucous membranes or subcutaneous injections following a small bore needle obviously one can understand moderate exposure is exposure to mucous membranes with large volume or percutaneous superficial exposure with solid needles and a superficial cut or needle stick injury penetrating the glove a severe exposure is percutaneous exposure with large volume for example an accident with a high caliber needle visibly contaminated with blood a deep wound hemorrhagic wound or very painful transmission of a significant volume of blood or an accident with material that has previously been used intravenously or intra arterially so categories of situations depending on the result of the source this if the source is hiv negative a definition of the risk in the source is source is not infected but still one has to consider for hep b and hep c prophylaxis uh, and the low risk is hiv positive but clinically asymptomatic and high risk is hiv positive and clinically also symptomatic so regarding the third step it is counseling for pep informed consent has to be taken appropriate information on the pep what are the risks what are the benefits it should be clear that pep is not mandatory you should not force somebody to take pep but one has to explain tell the benefits tell the risk information on the window period baseline test safety and efficacy of drugs including those during pregnancy a psychological support also need to be provided to every person who is exposed so we had need to inform them about the risk and the measure that can be taken some people might require psychological support and special leave also can if you know the duration is 4 weeks so a special leave can also be granted uh from the work and recording and reporting format as per the naco guidelines is also essential so after this we have to assess the need of pp and we have to prescribe the pp so we have to decide regarding the regime we have to look at the availability and prescription and also vaccination for hepatitis b in case there is a sexual assault pp should be given to the exposed person as part of the overall pa package of post sexual assault care HIV testing of the source person should not delay the decision whether to start the PP or not. Start the PP first, and if required, then refer for consultation. In case of high risk exposure, occupational or non-occupation from a source patient who has been exposed to or is taking ARV, this is a very important point. Then consult an expert to choose the PP regime, as there is if the source might be is already on second line or on third line and is also failing. then the, the same drugs obviously cannot be used for the pp uh, the expert has to take a call and has to start the pp regime to which the source has not really been exposed to so you know evaluating evaluation of the occupational uh, sources known sources test the known sources for hiv antigen anti hcv and hiv direct viral assays for routine screening of source patients are not recommended consider using rapid hiv testing um these all these tests have to be done after uh, consent if the source person is not infected with blood borne pathogen uh, baseline testing or further follow up of the exposed person is not necessary most important thing is do not test the discarded needles for blood borne pathogens for source where the infection status remains unknown the or the source is refusing the testing because i as i told you this has to be done after consent then consider medical diagnosis look at the clinical symptoms and take the risk history of high risk behavior for unknown source evaluating the likelihood of exposure to source at high risk of infection consider the high likelihood of blood borne pathogens among the patients in the exposure setting now to the one of the most important parts when should the pp be started as soon as possible so this uh, graph tells you that efficacy wanes over a period of time if you the delay in pep will decrease the efficacy so uh, you know at what point it is no longer worth it we've already told about that the the window period or the time till frame that we generally take is 72 hours and after beyond a certain point the risks of pep the drug side effects all drugs have side effects the risks of side effects with pep way 
much higher than the true benefit which one would draw uh, from starting pep later on and why it is important this cartoon will help you understand that on day 0 when there is exposure to hiv at the mucosal surface like sexual exposure within the first two days the virus is collected by the dendritic cells and carried on to the lymph nodes and after four days hiv replicates in cd4 cells and re is released into the blood so once from four day onwards if it is already been released into the blood it will go and home into uh, different issues i think we've already lost the window of having any benefit out of giving a post exposure prophylaxis and then subsequently from 11 day onwards the it is going to go into and spread into different organs so there are studies what is the timing what's the evidence evidence comes from the animal studies animal models and and animal pp studies suggest that substantial less efficacy beyond 24 to 36 hours case control studies most subjects in each group received pp within 4 hours and analysis of pp failures does not suggest a clear cut off uh, how long it should be given again you look at this diagram 28 days the risk of conversion 0% in this 24 in the study in macaques 24 macaques um who were uh, uh, intravenously infected 10 days 25% risk and 3 days pp risk is as high as 50% so this is the basis of giving the the pep for uh, uh, 28 days um so in animal model 28 days more affected than 10 days of 3 day or 3 days of pp 28 days used in case control study and that is what is recommended by the cdc guidelines so as i said pp pp should preferably be within 72 hours of exposure if the healthcare personnel presents after 72 hours pp can still be considered after counseling if there is a high volume large risk exposure then perhaps you might be consider considering it but not in the routine if the low to moderate exposure is there pp should be made available in the emergency department in the labor rooms in the icus and operation theaters the exposed person should go to the designated person as soon as possible for complete risk assessment hiv counseling testing and pp all hospital staff members must also be aware and those who join new may be they may also be made aware from time to time that where to report for pep and what, where the drugs are available like in our institution they are available in the emergency uh, at two places and also available in the emergency pharmacy uh, so i think everybody is made aware from time to time at least three different places for medicine uh, for physicians it is available around the clock so when to obtain an expert opinion when there is a delay in reporting as already alluded to it cannot be done decision cannot be taken by everybody it has to be taken by the experts unknown source with the source is not known use of pp to be decided on case to case basis after considering the severity of exposure and epidemiological likelihood of hiv transmission but do not delay pp if it is indicated if the source patient is on art or has possible hiv drug resistance as i've already alluded to then also a expert consult has to be done because then the drugs have to be chosen to which the source is not exposed to uh, the major uh, the minor side effects can be managed symptomatically but for major side effects then again an expert opinion has to be sought uh, whenever there is doubt or there are complications like major psychological problem then again an expert opinion has to be sought so again there are exposure codes uh with there is a if there is blood bloody fluids or potentially infectious material or instruments contaminated with these if it is no obviously pp is not required if it is yes then we have to look at the type of exposure if it is mucous membrane or skin integrity compromise and it's just small volume few drops small duration exposure code is one but if it is large volume major splash long duration exposure code is two if it again intact skin no pp is required as i already alluded to percutaneous exposure severity less severe solid needles superficial scratch exposure code 2 more severe hollow bore needle deep injury exposure code 3 i think i have already kind of trying to sensitize you before about it then is the source code hiv negative we know that pp is not required hiv positive low titer exposure patient is asymptomatic cd4 is high source code is 1 high titer exposure advanced disease 
low CD4, suppose, uh, source code is 2. HIV status is unknown, the source code is also unknown. So these are the various schema, exposure code 1 and source code 1, the PP is not required. For all durations, the PP is for 28 days. Uh, if the source code is unknown, consider PP if HIV prevalence is high in a given population in the region and risk categorization is there. And this otherwise exposure code, all these exposure code one and source codes two onwards, you have to give PEP. What are the recommended regimes? We have reached a stage where adolescent or adult more than 10 years and weight more than 30 kg have to give, be given TLD. We are all aware about that. Alternative regime is tenofovir, lamivudine plus lopinavir, ritonavir, uh, or uh, plus lamivudine or efavirenz. This is a if either preferred regime is not available or contraindicated. Children more than six years and weight more than 20 kg, zidovudine, lamivudine, and doltegravir. And if we can't use zidovudine, HB is less than nine, then we use a bacavir, lamivudine, and doltegravir. If it's a child which is less than six years or less than 20 kgs, we can't use doltegravir, then we can use zidovudine, lamivudine, and lopinavir, etaminavir. And again, if the HB is less than 10 instead of zidovudine, we can use a bacavir. Uh, we should also know how to use the side effects. If minor side effects like nausea, take with fluid, reassure that these will go away and we have to give symptomatic treatment. Headache, we have to give paracetamol. And if the patient is on effervorance based therapy, then we have to tell that it will go away uh, in some time. But if it persists for more than two weeks, then you can ask for an expert opinion. If there is some diarrhea, follow the diarrhea guidelines, reassured that if it is due to ARV, it will improve in a few weeks time follow up in two weeks. If it does not improve, then we ask for a consult. Fatigue is very common. It can be there up to four to six weeks. Take a sick leave. This leave can be guaranteed by the nodal officer or this SMO, MO, ART center. If severe or longer than this, then an expert opinion has to be sought. Uh, if evidence is known to cause uh, vivid neurological side effects, so it has to be taken before sleeping and counseling and support has to be provided. The initial difficult time can be managed with amitriptyline at bedtime, which is, and call for advice if the severe depression is there or if there are suicidal tendencies or there is psychosis, then it has to be stopped. Rash, especially if the, the efeverens, we know that efeverens used to, and even the NNRTAs are associated with skin rashes. Uh, assess carefully if it is dry or wet, call for the advice. If it is generalized or peeling, then it is a severe reaction, then stop immediately. Rarely, Stephen Johnson syndrome kind of a manifestation, which can be life-threatening, have also been reported. If this kind of rash is there, then we have to stop the, the PEP immediately. If there is fever, assess clinically for hepatitis. If th this could be due to HIV infection or non-HIV related issues, if the we can ask for an expert opinion there. If, it is, if there is clinical jaundice, then, then PEP has to be stopped and an expert consultation has to be taken. We have to ask for LFTs, uh, ALT tests, and stop ARVs, and we have to call for an expert opinion. We know that HB risk transmission is much higher after percutaneous exposure. So if the person has never been vaccinated, we have to give complete HBV vaccination. If has been vaccinated, but we don't know the anti-HBS status, we have to give a booster. We, mind it, we don't have to wait or if this test is not available, we, do, we don't wait for this test report. We give a booster. If the person has been vaccinated for more than five years, then again, give a booster. If this test is available, person is vaccinated and the antibody levels are more than 10 international units, then it probably may not be required. But one has to remember that there is no prophylaxis available against hepatitis C. Next is the laboratory uh, evaluation. Uh, in person taking PEP, we have to get the baseline HIV, HCV, and HBS antigen, complete blood count and serum trimenesis because occupational exposure might have occurred previously and somebody might have a gathered in infection previously. Then obviously there is no, uh, no need, there is no role of post-exposure prophylaxis and the treatment decision has to be taken based upon the treatment guidelines. And if the person is not taking PEP, then still also, we have to just get the HIV, HCV, and HBS antigen done. What is different is the on therapy, we have to get the blood work um, counts and the liver enzymes done. And exposed person 
not taking pp also has to be counseled for testing of hiv hbs antigen at 6 weeks uh 12 weeks and 24 weeks from the date of exposure how do we follow up the source person uh, exposed person uh, whether pp has been started or not uh, we have to do a clinical follow up look for the signs of indicating sero conversion like acute fever general lymphadenopathy skin eruptions pharyngitis flu like symptoms ulcers in the mouth or genital area uh, these symptoms appear in half to one th two third of almost 50 to 70% of individuals with a primary hiv infection and almost always within the 3 to 6 weeks after the exposure so clinical monitoring the first i have told you and other things which are important are avoid donating blood avoid breastfeeding avoid pregnancy person should also take precautions for sexual relationship condom prevention protection adherence and uh, adverse drug reaction counseling has also to be provided uh what is the laboratory follow up during and after pep within at week 2 and week 4 we again have to do the counts especially if the those on azt uh, we know that it causes anemia fasting blood sugar or random blood sugar in the patients on doltegravir and a serum creatinine levels especially the ones on a becavir uh week 6 week 12 and week 24 we have to do get the hiv testing done Uh, we also have to tell that they also have to get the hep b and hep c uh, uh testing done so the care pathway assessment early assessment for post exposure prophylaxis hiv testing of the exposed person and the source if possible provision of the first aid in case of skin broken skin or other wounds counseling and support for risk of hiv risks and benefits of pp side effects enhanced counseling if uh, if pp is to be given and specific support in case of sexual assault prescription pp should be initiated as soon as possible and 28 the prescription is recommended age appropriate arv drugs i have got i have told you that we have to provide the information about the drugs which are being given one has to follow up is by assessing the underlying comorbidities possible drug drug interactions hiv test has to be done at 6 weeks 3 months and 6 months after exposure i have already told you that link to hiv treatment if it is required at some point in time unfortunately prevention proposition provision of prevention intervention as appropriate so preventing exposure to and transmission of hiv and other viruses so there are different activities which are associated uh, with needle stick of sharp injuries the most injuries occur during these things are used and then subsequently followed by in between the steps and other causes and then subsequently there are other various situations like after use before disposal after use during disassembling the uh, these things during disposal putting them into the container so after use defies left on the floor table or bed recapping that that again is also very important and in preparation for reuse and devices associated with percutaneous injury by percentage of total percentage of injuries reported so the most important is um, you know disposable syringes suture needles scalpel disposable scalpel reusable things vacuum tubes winged butterfly needles retractors skin bone or bone hooks electrocautery wire drill burr all these which are used by orthopedicians so practice that influences the risk of occupational exposure the most important is recapping please never never try to recap the other is transferring a body fluid between the containers handling and passing needles or sharp after use and the way they are changed kidney trays should be used instead of uh, you know passing from hand to hand failing to dis you dispose of used needles properly in puncture resistant sharp containers and poor healthcare management practices as i already told you this is a big no no never try to cap a needle i think from my personal um, experience being in this institute also many of the healthcare providers when they try to to cap is the one when they end up having the needle stick injury so practices which reduce the risk strict compliance to standard workplace precautions avoid the use of injections where safe and effective alternatives are available like oral drugs wherever you can use oral drugs in place of injections use them avoid recapping promptly dispose use needles uh, needle needle cutters or needle destroyers are available should be available in all healthcare settings uh, 
report all needle stick and sharp related individual injuries promptly to ensure that you receive appropriate follow up care participate in training related to infection prevention use devices with safely with safety features provided by the institute wherever possible record and monitor injuries with an injury register that has to be done at the art center level standard work precaution precautions are the standard precaution is to prevent the exposure uh, of healthcare workers and patients to blood borne pathogen these must be practiced regarding the blood and all other potentially infectious materials hand washing the standard procedures are uh, precautions are hand washing before and after all medical procedures safe handling and immediate safe disposal of sharps again reiterating not capping the needles using special containers for sharps using needle cutters or destroyers using forceps instead of fingers for guiding sutures using vacuum cleaners safe decontamination of instruments use of protective barrier this is again very important wherever indicated to prevent direct contact with blood or body fluid such as gloves masks like we've seen that people doing a tracheostomy there is a certain gush of secretions after tracheostomy Uh, and there is an exposure so gloves should be worn goggle uh, you know, the, the goggles should be worn um, uh, and then aprons and boots should also be worn to prevent the injuries and healthcare personnel who has a cut or abrasion should cover the wound before providing care and there has to be a safe disposal of contaminated waste uh, again as this is just being highlighted once again the eye shield uh, the mask the gloves you know the needle destroyers the use of kidney tray this again is a needle destroyer so all these should be um, these should become a standard workplace practices i think with this i'll wish to thank all of you for joining me and uh, i'll be happy to address if there are any questions if there are any concerns uh, if there are any anything that i can add to thank you very much for your patient hearing thank you so much sir uh, we have one question in the chat box sir uh which abs to check for hepatitis b vaccination core surface or envelope uh which which antibody to check to check for, for hepatitis b vaccination core surface mm-hmm. or envelope well if i if i remember correctly i will have to check on that perhaps it is core uh, hbc but i think i will have to confirm okay sir uh because that is what we check for tarun? for starting immun yeah. Im- immun suppression right uh, dr tarun we'll get back to you on this sir we'll check with sir again on this and anti uh, hbc is generally done but i will want to make sure once again no problem sir uh, any more questions from the participants please feel free to unmute your mic one more way pep for hepatitis c what is the pep for hepatitis c again from that is what has Karun. been already told that has already been addressed there is no okay nothing like that for as hepatitis c uh there are no more questions sir can we quickly run the feedback form please uh, kiran sir can we have the feedback form please thank you Uh, the feedback form is now visible on your screen participants are requested to scroll through all the four questions and answer them requesting all the participants to please attempt the feedback poll thank you so much dr amin sir uh, so again i have just come back i have confirmed i think yes, uh, it is anti h it is against the surface antigen anti hbs for vaccination efficacy 
I think uh, Dr. Tarun, I think that's the not the yes. core core we we check before immunosuppression. And uh, this is the one that we check after vaccination. So there was a confusion. I've confirmed it. So it is more against the, the surface antigen, whereas core is checked before giving immunosuppression therapies. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, for facilitating today's RDLS session. Thank, thank you to you. all My the pleasure. participants for patient listening. So can we conclude this session now? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.